This week on Snark Squad Pod, we are joined by the Democracy Diva to talk about the final season of Game of Thrones. Welcome back to Snark Squad Pod. I'm Nicole Sweeney. My name is Maddie Vance. And as always for things Game of Thrones, this week we are joined by <laughs> Sam, the Democracy Diva. Hey guys, thrilled to be back. Can't wait to yell. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Democracy Diva. Sam is joining us once again. We have dedicated one episode to each of the books in the A Song of Ice and Fire series. And also on Snark Squad, we've recapped our way through the entire series. So one recap per episode on thousands and thousands of words dedicated to the series. And so we knew that because we were reading the books during the off season, that we wanted to come back and wrap up the final television series with an episode as well. And now it is my duty to do my best to recap what happened in this very short season hearing you say that reminds like makes me realize like we started the podcast during the off period right like the period the time between yeah. seasons was so fucking long that we did yes. a whole <laughs> year and a half worth of this podcast read all f- five published books plus the novellas uh okay cool 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 <laughs> maybe we'll get to this but something about like the long wait and what we got in the end was part of like the saltiness oh. of it all but <laughs> don't get me started we'll get don't there. get me yeah, before yeah. the synopsis Okay, okay, synopsis. In the first half of the season, we deal with the Great War. Team Danny reaches Winterfell only to learn that the Night King has breached the wall and he's on his way with a zombie dragon. Jon learns to ride a dragon and also learns that he's Aegon Targaryen, the real, real heir to the Iron Throne. If you ignore the bit where they kind of got thrown off the throne, so no Targaryen is an heir, but whatever. Cersei doesn't send the troops she promised, surprising everyone except Sansa. Jaime arrives to keep his word. Everyone is mad he's there, but Brienne speaks for him and they decide to keep him, which is great because he later knights Brienne. All the remaining named character, except for like three of them, get to Winterfell and their plan is decided. Bran is going to be Night King Bait. The army of the dead arrive, obliterate a lot of things, so there is a surprising amount of plot armor in the Great War, but <laughs> that's fine. The Night King makes it to Bran, but at the last minute, Arya super jumps into the scene and kills him with Valyrian steel. The whole army of the dead disintegrate. That done, in the second half of the season, we, it's time to deal with the last war and control for the Iron Throne. Danny wants Jon to pinky promise not to tell his sisters that he's really their cousin, but Jon can't do it. He tells them but makes them pinky promise not to tell anyone else, but Sansa can't do it. She tells Tyrion, who tells Varys, who (laughs) is immediately (laughs) Team Penis on the Iron Throne. Danny leaves with the combined army towards King's Landing and gets inexplicably ambushed at Dragonstone. Missandei is captured in the process and Rhaegal the dragon is killed. Missandei is beheaded by Cersei in the mountain, angering Danny and Grey Worm. Jaime and Brienne hook up, but then Jaime drops her like it's hot to go save his sister lover. Uh. Danny finds <laughs> <laughs> Danny finds out that Varys is backing Jon for the throne and has him burned alive. Jaime is captured, but Tyrion releases him so he can go ring the bells and surrender the city during the upcoming battle. The war starts and Drogon just basically lights everything on fire. The surrender bells ring, but Danny decides she doesn't care and continues to light the entire city on fire. Jamie kills Euron, finds Cersei, and they die together under some rocks. <laughs> Arya and the Hound infiltrate the Red Keep, but then the Hound is like, just kidding, revenge is bad, go home. And Arya tries to, but barely makes it out of the city alive. The Hound fights the mountain, and they also die together. Danny is reign of terror continues with killing prisoners of war, arresting Tyrion for his betrayal, and giving speeches about freeing other cities like they freed King's Landing. Tyrion convinces Jon that this is real bad, and Jon fakes Danny out with a kiss before stabbing her to death. Drogon arrives to give the best funeral ever when he men- melts the Iron Throne and carries his mom away. Sometime later, all the remaining lords arrive in King's Landing to decide what to do. Tyrion nominates Bran for king. Everyone agrees 
except Sansa, who says the North did enough and it's going to stay independent. Thank you very much. John isn't allowed to go free because I think he told on himself for killing Danny. I don't know. Classic. Classic and John. His, yeah, and his punishment is banishment to the North. The Unsullied sail for Nath. Tyrion is hand of the king and reorganizes a small council. Sansa is crowned queen in the North and Arya sail for west of Westeros. John rejoins the Free Folk and Ghost at Castle Black and we see them head north of the wall. The end. Uh, All right. So we've already kind of like started to tease this out. So really quickly, we're going to do the gut check. Start where we always start. Did you like the final season of the show? Sam. I had to sit through that synopsis with my hands over my mouth so that I wouldn't interject every 10 seconds <laughs> with how dumb <laughs> everything is. So when I was writing my fake version of the synopsis, because I thought <laughs> y'all were going to make uh, me read it, I was like, oh, I'll just explain, you know, the narrative story of what happened in this season. But you can't do that because they didn't write a narrative story. They wrote an outline. And so we moved Moved from plot point to plot point with nothing in between to connect it, and it was infuriating to watch. And I really thought I was going to be less mad about it by now, <laughs> because <laughs> as, as of time of recording, it's been like a week and a half. <laughs> um, but in fact, no, I am uh, still mad uh, that everything. No, not everything. Um, significant parts of it were you know, non thought out and like clearly rushed very, very clearly. Um, so that's, so that's, a, that's, that's a big no, big no. I was enjoying it for the first three episodes. I think even when some of the early like defectors were like, this is trash. I was still like, I don't know, guys, I'm enjoying this. Um, but after, after the, the great war episode, which I think was three, I, I, came around to the fact that things were happening too quickly and it was all rushed and nothing was making sense. So it's hard because I feel like on its bad days, this show is still a better show than most of what's out there. But also it was so built up and it was so many years and we invested so much time. And this was just, this was not, not even like not what I wanted or not what I expected. It was poorly written and to see it all culminate into something that was poorly written was was really disheartening. So uh, it had great moments. It had some satisfying things. It had some really great performances. It had some stunning visuals. But the net of it for me is that, no, I did not like this. And I did not enjoy <laughs> a vast majority of it. I liked it the most of the three of us. But that is not like, really... <laughs> That's, <laughs> like, not, That's not a yes, to be clear. Um, I, like Mari, I was okay with with how we were starting. I think especially because it didn't really hit me that we only had six episodes to work with. Like, I don't know, the way that the way that the season opened felt like the way a lot of other seasons have opened, except other seasons had 10 episodes and this one only had six. And so the first couple episodes, I was like, uh, okay, like given everything that we have to do, uh, this feels this feels okay, I guess. Uh, and through the Battle of Winterfell, like even that episode, yes, there was a ton of plot armor, but I wasn't hugely bothered by it. And like there was that episode still traded heavily on what is the show show's greatest strength, which is like spectacle, uh, you know, what you could see of the spectacle <laughs> that is, <laughs> but, like, you know, I, like I was still with it. But uh, as has been said, it's when we start heading south that I was just like, oh, this is how we're going to race from, you know, plot moment to plot moment. I think Sam, I agree completely with what you've said that like the real problem is that they didn't flesh out the you know the moments between all of these beats and it was just really frustrating to watch the story be told in a way that is meaningfully different from the story that they the way that they were telling this story for the first you know like five seasons it was like it was a a a bit of a bait and switch to tell the final season in this fashion Uh, there are some things that I liked about this season 
But I think that given this baseline, um, you know, dislike, it maybe makes sense to start with like where it all went wrong. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't like the the list is is long, and so I'm not really even sure like um, where to start. Except with this, like this sort of overarching narrative narrative question, I had somebody on a friend on Twitter who liked the final season say something that like I'm still mad about. I'm I am not that mad about the final season now. I I have now largely moved into a place of like whatever this happened. I'm sure I'll get riled up while we're talking, and then I'm gonna forget about it again. Um, <laughs> yes. Like this, like kind of the place that I've reached with it. Goals. I, um, I I feel bad because this is this is like genuinely a friend of mine, somebody who I actually like. But he said something about how all the people who are complaining about it, if it had been, uh, you know, what we like, what we wanted, then we would have complained about it being predictable. And I, it frustrates me so much because the thing that I love about this story is that all of my favorite moments in this show and, you know, in the books as well is the degree to which like everything feels like it has this very satisfying payoff. Everything feels inevitable somehow. Like all of the most soul crushing moments, you look at them and like when they happen, you're like replaying like the all of the moments that led to that inevitable tragedy. And yes. like that's what I find so wonderful about this show uh, in the early seasons. And so that I don't know. So like that to me is the thing that was so frustrating about this final season. Like, I think that where everybody ends up, all of these final places, except for Bran on the throne, uh, all, everything else, I'm like cool with where we, where the characters land. I just don't, I am like frustrated by the fact that we didn't tell all the steps of how they got there. So my reaction to that is that this season actually did give me a lot of the things I wanted. Like I got, I wanted Mad Queen Danny. I got Mad Queen Danny. I wanted Good Queen Sansa in the North. I got Good Queen Sansa in the North. We got fucking Gen Gendria. We got fucking Canon Gendria this season. Like I got everything <laughs> I wanted. Um, we got Sir Brienne of Tarth, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. I got my dreams this season. And I didn't not like those things. It was the fact that there was no connective tissue between any of it and how we got to anything else that happened, or sometimes those things as well, didn't make any sense. Um, and I really, I like what you said um, about how it's different than how they used to tell this story. The problem is not that the show is not the books. We like, like they are different mediums. They are different projects. Like we can't even, I, I complain about it a lot, but I cannot expect the show to be the books. I can't expect the show to be the show. Um, and, and I don't think that this season it was. Um, and I think that's what made it really difficult for me. And what made me kind of resent the big moments that I had been wanting to happen and them not feeling at all satisfying, not because they were predictable, but because they weren't, told they were just shown yeah i think we'll probably get to this later in the episode as well but the experience of watching it live and like the discourse <laughs> around this season was a big part of how i experienced this as well for better or for worse or uh, for memes or for argument <laughs> i should say um but the, that whole idea of like you know people who are complaining any tweet that started that way i'm like yo Listen, you don't know me. <laughs> you don't know my life. <laughs> you don't know if I read the books or not. You don't know how many hours I invested this. Like, you don't know me. Like, don't lump people in, in any, you know, way on Twitter that way. Like, you're, you're, you're fixing for a fight, basically. But, you know, I, 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 there were things that I liked that were the end and there were things that I didn't like or the way that the show or the season felt that they were gunning for some unpredictability and the fact that, you know, they, they had multiple endings. So we would be thrown off that that is the type of storytelling that, you know, is not my favorite. I do want the narrative satisfaction of like, I saw this all along. It's the same kind of thing of like, since we saw Ned beheaded in season one, anytime somebody's being too honorable, we're like dead. And is that predictable? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it also makes sense. It's narratively satisfying. We get what world we're in because there's that through line of understanding who survives in this. So those aren't the things that are predictable and in 
a bad way. Those are the things you want to maintain. There's continuity. There's a narrative line. There's narrative follow through. And those are the pieces that I thought were either missing here or you you kind of saw where they were supposed to be, but we just didn't have time for them to be. We were rushing around so fast to get people into places that we weren't really, like uh, um, Sam said, we weren't really following it through. We weren't following all the steps for them to get there. So again, to me, my biggest complaint is not what happened, but how it yes. happened. And like the vehicle in which we were <laughs> transported in the season, like I, I just didn't like that at all. I think it's Sam mentioned, like, reading the books. Obviously, all three of us read the books. We talk about them all here on this podcast. Uh, but the, <laughs> I think the fact Nicole that we... Nicole is still mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, so the fact that, like, we read the five books in between the, the seasons is probably part of why one of... I have sort of two major reasons why I think um, it took me longer to turn on the show than either of you two uh, in this final season. So, like, for me, the last two books, definitely the last book, like exemplified all of the things that frustrate me about George R. R. Martin's storytelling. I-, I loved overall the story that he's telling. I got a lot out of reading the books. I will probably reread them at some point. I don't know, whatever. But like the... Yes. <laughs> Let's do every it's my podcast. Favorite. You know, <laughs> it is what it is. But like the just very painstaking, like this is, you are telling me too much information. You need to be edited down. It's cool that you know all of these things, but I don't need to know every fucking one of these things uh, in order to follow and track this story. And so... I was excited to go back to the like tightened up storytelling of the show. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously what we got was like just like that. But then sort of the other extreme, which I hated Mm -hmm. a lot more (laughs) as it turns out. (laughs) Um, But to me, it feels like there has to be something between um, George R. R. Martin, uh, who I feel like his version of this is going to be giving us a detailed recipe for every meal that Varys poisons. And like the show having Varys (laughs) openly discussing his treasons on a beach. Like they're like, I just... (laughs) Is there, can I please have a middle ground between those two ideas? That's all I want. I mean, the middle ground was arguably the first, you know, whatever season. Yeah, so like, that was, was we were that. watching that show. <laughs> right, that was what I wanted. They were giving me that. And again, like, of course they were able to do that better when they had full source material and not an outline to work with. But like, it felt like they translated they they didn't it felt like they didn't translate George's outline into a story they just filmed the outline and I know I keep saying that but it's in, it, it, it just like they truly could, half they the could dialogue have, is like callback dialogue too so almost, yes. like, all, of the dialogue, outline. almost all of the dialogue first of all is replaced by meaningful glances so half the dialogue <laughs> is meaningful glances the other like 25% of the rest is callbacks and 25% percent after that is like Braun telling a long story like fuck Uh everyone (laughs) (laughs) the other thing that I think contributed to like my sort of delayed and Mari mentioned this in terms of like the experience that you have with the thing and I I'm trying to figure out how to sort of parse this idea out into like a, a larger question but it is worth noting that I stopped recapping the show sometime in I think season I finished season five maybe is when I stopped and so this last season you guys were also recapping it and I think that there is something to be said for like that sort of you know spending more time with it like this season because they weren't telling all of the beats between it. It is designed to let it just like wash over you and then like take in the the sort of spectacle at the end. The part of the problem is that if you are taking the time to actually look closely at it, it like does not hold up to any sort of scrutiny whatsoever. Uh, and so I think probably the fact that you guys were taking the time to do that from the beginning made it made the the sort of the cracks <laughs> much more apparent earlier on. Weirdly, I think that was more true in previous seasons, um, only because they were longer. And so, um, and so right, like writing the recaps took more time. And in this, like, 
again, when like half the episode is so dark you can't see, and half the episode is people being set on fire, like the recaps did not take a long time to write this season for me at least. <laughs> and also, like, we've only done like four of them so far at time of recording, so like we'll get there. Um, but sorry, I moved. But like, it, it still doesn't take as much time to write, but this goes back to like Mari giving the synopsis for this season, right? Like, there was no, you, you didn't really didn't leave anything out because the whole freaking season was beat, 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 and like no sort of setup. It was just this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And like, I think that fact becomes much more apparent when you're actually trying to break down, okay, what happened here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it it really, more than any other season, I think it falls apart under the the barest, barest minimum of scrutiny. Um, it was just a relief that that took less time to get through this sure. season <laughs> when I was enjoying the show significantly less. But yes, I think it only, it only like further proves the point that like there was not a lot of there there this season. At some point, I made the choice to tweet about Miss Andy's death and about how she was the last woman of color on the show and she was executed the way that she was. And I don't know, I said something about being mad at it. And so um, a racist came into my mentions <laughs> pretty quickly. And that was an experience. But a lot of them ended up just like, you know, uh, kind of yelling about like me not thinking about it. Like, shh, don't think about it. Just watch. It was kind of like the <laughs> argument there. Love mm-hmm. that. Like, oh, love, yeah. I, right. I respond really so well to fun. that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Like, why can't you just enjoy media? Like, why can't you just? And so that, you know, this entire idea of like, I'm, I'm extra defensive and salty about it because that is totally valid. You can definitely have escapist media and just watch in a way where you're letting it wash over you. But and you started to say it and I immediately started like twitching because of the Twitter thing that I got into. So, uh, yeah, this this is definitely a season that if you think about it at all, it kind of breaks down. And we thought about it a lot because I had to recap it. So that was definitely true for me. When I was sitting there and typing, for some reason, Danny doesn't see the warships in front of her and they sail straight into the trap. You know, like I'm I'm Aww. upset, you know, I'm upset because now I have to quantify that. I have to give it words. I have to explain that something that doesn't have an explanation. Um, so while this was definitely easier, to recap than other seasons and it really made fun of itself <laughs> spending, <laughs> spending that additional time did not do the season any favors in my eyes and no I can't just watch it and not right. think about it also r- random reply guy on the internet you could just quietly enjoy my tweets and not right. criticize right. them right. Just right. Right. Um, that never seems to work out but <laughs> you also could just be quiet. So, I, you know, um, and yet here we all are. And yet here we all are being loud. <laughs> this is, uh, I think, ultimately where I kind of wanted to go with this is this question of like the larger fandom. I like that. That experience was weird for me this season. I don't know, like it just like being angry together. The memes were fun, but I just like being mm-hmm. angry together was exhausting to me. Not because I wasn't also <laughs> angry, but because I was like, I don't, I just, I can't. I can't, like I'm disappointed by the show, and then now everyone's upset, and it's not fun anymore. I just wanted to have fun, <laughs> um, and I. It, it's interesting because I feel like. I, I'm going to keep coming back to like what a betrayal of storytelling it was. But I feel like I got fairly involved in this fandom almost by accident. Probably the best part of reading the books for me was the realization that I had like actually low key become part of the like A Song of Ice and Fire fandom on the internet unintentionally. Yes. But just like because of the show, because I spent so much time, you know, on Tumblr or whatever, uh, like I was part of these larger fandom conversations. And I like the fandom is for this uh, universe is like very cool and interesting because there is so much going on. There is so much space to like explore character motivations and like have, you know, interesting, uh, like, you know, write interesting metas and and whatever. Like there's like the fandom for this universe is super interesting and cool. And then during this season, it just made me sad. (laughs) I was just, (laughs) I was just bummed out all the time. 
I listened to five different A Song of Ice and Fire podcasts, so like maybe I a little bit know what you're talking about in terms of this year cottage industry of fandom there is around the show. Um, I mean, I know of like multiple pretty recent podcasts making like five thousand dollars a month on Patreon, like talking about these books. Like, pe- like this is and this. It seems like everyone on Twitter is doing this. I say this as I record a Game of Thrones podcast, right. but we're doing this out of the <laughs> kindness of our hearts. Um, <laughs> Not $5,000 a month. <laughs> but if you'd like to get us to $5,000 a month, you can go to patreon.com slash narcsquad. Perfect. I handed that to you on a silver platter. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed you know, as I get deeper and deeper into the like Twitter fandom and following different podcasters and people who write about the show. Um, it is so interesting because there's so much source material to work with that your analysis material can be incredibly robust and amazing. However, (laughs) um, uh, the, the the sheer volume of media about this, not just from fandom, you know, self-made fandom media, but the, you know, capital M media and like five different recappers per mm. publication for each episode. I can't blame them. I consumed every single piece. <laughs> so I can't pretend like there isn't an audience for that clickbait because I am clearly it. But It was exhausting. And to be quite honest, I really benefited from the fact that I moved into a new apartment the day of the the finale, because my, uh, my busy schedule kept me like, not away from conversations, but like, I couldn't focus all of my time on reacting to Game of Thrones, (laughs) which was definitely healthier for me and better for the podcast, because like now I feel like I'm fired up again for the first time. You're ready. Yeah. I'm like, I'm ready. I, (laughs) I moved a lot of boxes. Let's do this. I I had like a mostly okay experience. I know I just talked about random racists in my replies, but aside from for, that, for the, <laughs> aside from that, um, I I think that the memes were fun and it was enjoyable to kind of like experience it. Some of those moments, especially real time, like yeah. there was a great video of like the reaction to Arya when she stabbed the Nike, like that kind of like mass like reacting together was was fun for me for the most part. The memes were fun for me for the most part like game of thrones twitter is so freaking witty uh, i don't understand like there there was a lot to enjoy there it started to get away from me when we headed into this spot of like all you people complaining or all you people who enjoyed it or like the the there's you know, one kind right of, opinion and it's right, like a moral right. it's a moral quality moral. <laughs> to have yeah, the yes. correct opinion. like <laughs> you as a person are incorrect <laughs> like your entire existence is wrong Based because the, your feelings about this fucking TV show. <laughs> yes. And that's 100% where it went. And I was just like, why? And why are we doing this right now? Yes, like, absolutely. that became unenjoyable to me. And for me, that exacerbates the dislike of the season because, like, we thought about this more than the showrunners who put a water bottle <laughs> and a cup of coffee in a shot this season. What the fuck? Fuck, guys. So that's the other portion of this is that like there, there was a moment where I was thinking about like how much all of that legwork that fandom did, book fans and TV shows like pre this kind of set us up for failure because we, we, I think objectively, like we put more hours into this than the writers actually <laughs> did. I don't know. I feel like we did a ton of work. And so when it got to here, when it was maybe not the best writing, my sister turned to me at one point and she was like, how are we noticing more than the writers did? And I'm like, oh, honey, you don't understand. <laughs> like, <laughs> Of course we did. We've been invested in this, like to a level where like it led us up to this moment. So I don't know. I think there's a portion of that, like all of the headcanon and all of the like figuring it out and trying to piece these things together that almost kind of dug us into a hole, especially because the writing here was not good. But for the most part, I enjoyed the memes and stuff. Whether you like this or dislike this, you're fine. You're doing great. <laughs> you're doing <That's> amazing. <laughs> I mean, maybe you're not doing amazing, but it has nothing to do with your opinion of this show. <laughs> right. <laughs> Listen, we're all doing terribly, and it has nothing to do with Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> there were also moments that, like, in the discourse, where I was talking about this, and I realized 
very quickly that I had turned into the, oh no, I've read the books yes. fan. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Welcome to the And party. I was like, oh no, who am I? <laughs> yeah, there was a whole identity experience around reading the books between the the big gap. So <laughs> that was interesting. You're, you're welcome, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to at least acknowledge that like there were some things <laughs> that went right. I don't know. For me, I feel like fundamentally what went wrong here is in the writing. Like it, the, it was, this final season was badly written and then everybody else kind of had to do their jobs on top of that, you know? Uh, and so most of the, most of the things that I think are wrong really happen at the, you know, at the script level. And then I don't know. Yeah, everybody else is just sort of trying to do their jobs and like make the most of what they've got. <laughs> uh, there, there were a couple of like really, really lovely, wonderful visuals. Not a couple more. There were a ton of things, a ton of visual moments in this season that stand out to me as things that like, assuming the books get to that same place, assuming George actually writes them uh, and the books do get to the the sort of same similar beats that this season hits, which honestly, like I mostly like I expect that they largely will. Um, but I like I think about, you know, Danny walking through that throne room full of ash. Like, yes, the, like there's so much like bad <laughs> in the writing around that moment. <laughs> but that moment was like beautiful. Like it was it was beautiful. It was beautifully shot. Uh like Amelia Clark, who was a hater of for a really long time. Like I think she did a great job in that final sort of, you know, as she's walking through and having that little moment. Uh, again, she didn't have that much to work with on the page. I think they did all of that stuff really, really well. And it was really nice to get to watch some of my favorites have like these big moments. Uh, Brienne being knighted. I watched that episode twice and I saw and I, I knew I, I watched it late, so I didn't watch it when it was happening. That was uh, Coachella weekend. But I saw I was spoiled on Twitter. I knew it was coming. I ended up watching that episode twice. And both times I sobbed when she <laughs> when she's getting knighted, uh, seeing Sansa be Queen of the North. So like there were a lot of really, really lovely things that I was like grateful to get to see on screen. Yeah, I uh, I think for me the the highlight of the season was definitely um, a night at the Seven Kingdoms. Um, the the what were supposed to be everybody's last hours on Earth before the Night King came, but <laughs> don't. Okay, that, that's a tangent. Well, you can read you can read that tangent in the recap on Starksquad.com. Um, but um, <clears throat> so it was supposed to be everyone. <laughs> last hours uh, but that didn't pan out but but we got to see this show do what it does best in, besides explosions and spectacle um but what made this show more than just spectacle after spectacle was human characters having feelings and interacting with each other and 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 the personal and the relationships uh um uh, I, when when Ben Wyatt on Parks and Rec talks about why he loves Game of Thrones, he yells, they're telling human stories in a fantasy world. And it's always so <laughs> funny to me because like that is how I feel about the show because I am also a nerd. But, but being able to see Brienne get knighted, I mean, as like the peak, peak moment of like, what a beautiful moment this show can produce and like what a perfect scene it can do. Um, and so much of that episode had that kind of warm, but foreboding feeling that the show has always nailed. And then there didn't really seem to be followed through after that. They raised the stakes so high themselves for the battle of Winterfell episode that, you know, they couldn't be reached, let alone exceeded. And it also, as we just spent many minutes saying, like, it didn't feel like they did the work to get it there. But I loved, you know, I loved, I loved the scene of Brienne get indicted. And I agree that there were visual moments that I will take away, you know, forever. The, the like dragons in front of the moonlight, um, uh, during the, the long night episode, um, the, the Dothraki f- flames being extinguished. Um, there were, there were visual moments moments that were incredible this season as there always will be on a show like this yeah Sansa Queen in the North that's pretty much my uh yes. my highlight there <laughs> and I know <laughs> visually also just like the costuming her, her crown oh my God, that whole so moment beautiful. was just 
breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. Um, I also, it was like I've multiple times said that Amelia Clark is the weak link on the show. And that's still true. I'm not taking that back. She did so much better this season. And also I was clickbaiting, clicking on every like interview and everything about the season as well. And she, the the actress, Amelia Clark, was so endearing in some of the things that she, like some of the interviews and things. She also was not a fan of this season and the writing in it. So some of that stuff was like, oh man, I was hard on her. I mean, she really couldn't act, but she did better this season. Well, so I, that she, was a highlight. I actually, the, watching her this season, I was frequently struck by you just have nothing to work with here. Yes. And so like to me, it's hard to pin any of that on her. And so and I do think she did a, like a much better job this season than like in season one. Like I think it's actually really cool that you can, you know, watch her grow as an actress over the course of the eight seasons of the show. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, like, if she was just given permission to emote the season, like, is that what happened? I don't know, <laughs> because suddenly there was, like, emotion there. And I was like, oh, look at this. She can do it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, she was given nothing to work with and did incredibly well, given the circumstances. Um, Cersei, until her death scene, was given literally nothing to do but stare out a window and drink yes. wine. Yes. I mean, like, virtually <laughs> nothing. And then, like, also be mad about elephants iconic though Ico truly <laughs> iconic but like that speaks to like the like uh, what an outstanding actress lena Headey is that like i can at least a little bit care about cersei staring oh, out the window i will drinking wine. watch lena yes absolutely she cersei can stare out a window just sipping wine right. Right, making different faces yes i'm into it but i will say that like her storyline had nowhere to go, and so anytime in the big, in the first half of the season, anytime we were there instead of instead of in the north, I was like, I, I don't care. There's nobody here I'm invested in. You haven't right. done anything new with Cersei in years, and there's nobody around her who's interesting. She's surrounded by like a zombie and the guy who made the zombie, and like that's it. And this and and fucking Memorial Day weekend sale, Pacey. So I wanted to care more about what Cersei was doing, but they didn't give her anything to do. So that made it pretty difficult. Um, and also she and Jamie should not have both have gotten what they always wanted, which was to die in each other's arms. The end. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> that makes me curious. Like I kind of do want to talk a little bit more about these endings just because I'm curious whether you liked or didn't like them, but it, it makes me curious. I, at first, I was like, there was no way this could have happened except for the Great War first and the Last War second. And I, I understood that, like, as we were doing it. But after the Great War was over and we, like, defeated the Night King, there was a level of, like, well, now I just don't really care yeah. who gets the Iron Throne. Like, I don't know. And, and I kept going back and forth. Like, at, at one point, I was like, well, I do like what it's saying about, like, Cersei being, like, the ultimate threat really here, you like, you know, uh, compared against like this like zombie dude but also I don't know it felt a little anticlimactic so how did you guys feel about doing that in that order I am on record as having not liked it <laughs> like I see your point about why it could have been better to tell the story that way and to flip the expectation of what will happen last and I think if they had flipped it from the Night King is the big bad to Cersei is the big bad it would have been one thing but then one episode later they flipped it to no actually Danny is the big bad and all, mm. all of a sudden she's literally Hitler and while I think Mad Queen Danny is a really interesting story to tell that will be told and is already being told in these books <laughs> there is no story being told that ends in literally Hitler. <laughs> so that was um that that was hard for me to 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 wrap my head around. I generally feel like this makes sense to me. So like I I definitely like was caught off guard by it, but the to me the like the way that we're coming around to the end and I don't know, it's so hard to talk about this, right? Because obviously you know, we began this podcast, we talked for a really long time about how we all don't think that like they actually got, you know, they really correctly told the story between all the beats, right? So like, given that we, we know, we all know that sort of baseline, setting that aside. <laughs> uh, I like the part of what I think they're going for here is this idea of uh, there being something a little bit circular in it all, like the fact that John ends up back in the North. And like, uh, the you come back around to like, 
to these sort of very human stories in the end. And like, uh, I don't know, that works for me in theory. And I'm looking forward to reading a version of that that is fleshed out. <laughs> right. Uh, listen, I will say it. it if if I needed my anticipation for the book to be any greater, <laughs> you know, I didn't. But this season definitely helped me be like, some of these are really, some of these moments have power. And I'm interested to see how we actually get there. And it's unfortunate that that's how, how I feel about it, that it's how we actually get there and not how the books get there. But like, the show didn't give me any way to get there. <laughs> So it's difficult to say that, uh, you know, if this had been giving the, given the proper space and weight, how that would have played, which I, is what you're saying, I, I suppose, Nicole. But also, I feel like there was a portion of this that, like, all along we're like, oh, the, the, like, the Iron Throne is not the thing. Winter's coming. Like, oh, shit, here it comes. This is the real thing. And then I was like, no, it ain't. We did that already. Okay, back to the Iron Throne. And that was the part that was like, well, I don't... What? What? Um, so I don't know. It just, <laughs> that that like the flip flop felt a little. And again, had it been given more time and more weight, like maybe I would have come around in my feelings to it. But the fact that the message was to me so clearly like everyone's paying attention to this one thing when this other thing is coming from them for them in another direction. But then that like never really paid out to me. The one piece of it that I am actually not super optimistic about because I I just it's hard for me to see a version of this that works, but you know, we'll see. Maybe I'm like happy to be proven wrong, but the Bran arc, yeah, like there, there's, there's no version in which the, he doesn't suck. Like what? I, I'm sorry, what? Like what is he doing? I don't know. I just, especially because we're not given, we have not yet been given in the books, and maybe we will be given some sort of more like satisfying explanation of how his like his powers work. But I, something that comes to mind, uh, Endgame also had its flaws, and Doctor Strange uh, is not a character that I care a ton about. But he's there. He's the one like you know can see the future character, uh, and he like has a line in Infinity War about I don't know like the million to one like type odds to you know for like there's there's one way everything has to happen very precisely and there's one way we win. Uh, but it might we might not like there's you know there's just there's a single possibility and I can see like a multitude of possibilities, but we're not. And like that, that makes it work. Like that makes it make a sort of sense that like Strange is then going to do whatever his part is in the very specific sequence of events that have to get them to the outcome where they can win. We don't get anything like that with Bran. <laughs> <laughs> like any sort of se- like it seems Bran appears to just be like completely omniscient, and so like I, I just am like I don't I don't understand what you've been up to. Uh, like there's no version in which you're not a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have I, I don't know how to improve upon that. Um, Bran didn't make any sense the whole season. Bran hasn't made sense for quite a bit. And Bran as literal king definitely doesn't it. make sense. I hate it so I don't much. like it one bit. I hate it. It doesn't make... And that's probably the only thing that I'm like, I really hope this doesn't happen in the books. Or that, like, George's version of it is, like, Bran warging into whoever is king, you know? Like, something. <sighs> um... <laughs> Was that an exasperated sigh? Yeah, I, it's an exasperated <laughs> sigh because I, I can't see it, Sam. I can't see it. I can't I, see I, how we make this not I, stupid. I, I, I can't either. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just hoping. I'm just hoping it isn't. I'm hoping it isn't real. That's what we're down to is straight denial. Um, and yes, I want to pick just the things I like, which is good Queen Sansa. Uh huh. Good um, Queen Sansa. Uh, um. Uh, uh, forever. I was and ever. so mad when because T- like Tyrion's wind up, Tyrion's like nonsense speech. Like I don't really know why you're. T- I don't on like everything about you being here and like why this whole you, like why are we listening to this, you right like i don't know why are you the boss in this moment i don't yes. know but like you're leading you're like okay there's like one person we, yeah Tyrion. there's one person and then he says bran oh man so betrayed so um, betrayed so betrayed <laughs> there are a few things about the bran storyline that got to me personally one is that bran storyline throughout this whole like show has been the most boring to me 
Like, so there wasn't even a sense of like, wow, we got to see him do cool stuff. And now look at this. No, it was, it was like <laughs> the boring guy been to all me. The cool stuff. No. <laughs> no, no, no. The guy has let other people drag him around. And I don't know. He was in the woods for a while. Like, I don't know. It was weird. Second, like the whole brand, the broken thing was so gross. Oh, yes. um, really? Yes. That's, that's what you're going to go with? The brand, the broken, especially because your whole speech is about how he has an amazing story. He's literally the most powerful person there in Omniscient. And you're like, oh, I know, broken. That's a Mabelist bullshit. So great. The last piece of it to me is that idea of like the, I'm not usually a person that is like cheering on rules and magic, but I think that this aired on the side of having so little rules and the, the fact and the idea that we don't know how this all works and we never got an explanation. Mm-hmm. And we spent the last one or two seasons even going, I'm not Bran. I'm not Bran. I'm not Bran. I'm totally not Bran. And then at the last minute, they were like, Bran. And he's like, yes, I am king. And you're like, wait a second. Like, we just spent this whole time saying you're not Bran. Like, I don't know what's happening. It's the same complaint, I think, very similar to whole Arya faceless man thing where everybody was asking, why didn't you just wear a face and do some more stuff? Because we don't know the rules. We don't know how this works. Was that a one and done thing? We, we don't know. So there's no reason for us to explain this away. And the same thing happened with Bran. Like, I, I don't I don't know who's king right now. It's kind of gross that you have a king that can like just warg into whoever he wants. Yep. That seems like an abuse of power. Uh-huh. Um, but like that's where you went. I'm not sure why like we should it. trust him any more than the dragon queen. <laughs> like, uh. Also, if he knew how all of this was going to like the line, I think the line from Brand's storyline that really just broke my brain and not in a good way was um was him saying, why do you think I came all this way? And it's like, wait, you're telling me that, like, the Three-Eyed Raven, like, found you in your dreams, and then all of these people, like, schlepped around the world and died for you to get north to defeat the Night King, but actually only so that you could be king in the end? Uh-huh. That's the story? No, uh-huh. that's that's not how this works. Like, there is, again, there is no world in which that <laughs> makes sense or, like, can be true. So I, I resented that. And so, like, again, like, like if they hadn't flipped the whole, like, oh, the JK, the long night was actually only six hours long. If they hadn't, like, tried to flip that on its head... I don't know, just just flipping Bran from, like, you know, prophecy boy created to uh, <laughs> to see all things and destroy all, you know, or the big evil from him to be like, oh, actually, mm, I just kind of wanted to be king. <laughs> like, like what? If they had shown him using his powers in any way that was, like, contributing to the rest of the season, like, you know, being a good leader or I, I, I all, it would have been one thing, but he literally was just there saying creepy things and mm-hmm. not contributing in any way that we could be like, wow, having all that power sure makes him a good leader. No, he just was staring at people and repeating what they said in the past. That's not a good leader. What are you doing? Also, Tyrion, Brandon doesn't have the best story on the show. And do you know how we know that? Because they left him off of the in- of one entire season of the show and nobody <laughs> noticed. <laughs> so like, John, like, uh, uh, I'm I'm no fan of Jon Snow for king, but at least that guy came back from the dead. Like that's an interesting story, all right? <laughs> like give me that, but actually just give me Sansa. But no, all of the you know that whole scene with the ridiculous reunion council. Um, uh, uh, it was it was absurd to see all these people just be like, yeah, I guess that sounds about fine. Like, yeah, yeah, I guess. Like. Yes. And like, why, why did Grey Worm invite them there in the first place? Like, what, what is any of that? Like, and, be, and, and this again is a moment where we're not getting any sort of logical explanation. We just cut from Danny dead to all of these people gathered in this weird council. Like, right. Why? And, and Dorne only has one set of robes, which is very sad for the Dornish people. Um, <laughs> cause a new nameless prince of Dorne is just sitting there in the same threads we've <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know no uh, again uh, we're not asking like deep probing questions it's things right. like if one of the seven kingdoms can be independent why wouldn't the other kingdoms who have fought for independence throughout this entire show like the iron islands and dorn why wouldn't they also be like yeah peace out or you know why would literally 
any of them agree to have Bran as their king. Why are we calling him Bran the Broken, which is horrific, without even an in-world explanation for, like, no, here's why that's not horrific here, you know? <laughs> like, not even that. It's, like, just horrible. Yeah, why anybody listens to Tyrion, especially after the last, like, three seasons of Tyrion never making a good decision ever uh, is is really beyond me at this point. My little sister, uh, she she hates on me because Sansa is my favorite character and she doesn't get it. And so she was like complaining to me about how Sansa betrayed Jon and when she told him a secret oh, and well. she didn't even like st- yeah stand up for him like at the end and say that he was a Targaryen. And I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Jon himself could have outed him. As a- I don't like, why is this hard responsibility why is this her responsibility and the fact that john like told on himself for killing danny at some point and then the fact that he's a targaryen but that doesn't really matter at all i guess for who gets to sit on the throne and uh, uh, and then it's just like bran is now the king like none of that felt satisfying at all and not even in the way that we've discussed a million times where it's like the pieces were missing but the end game there none of that to me felt like it it followed through with any of the buildup that we received and like i got what i always wanted out of this show which was a room full of northern men chanting queen in the north queen in the north queen in the (laughs) north and not only did i get that those were the final words of game of thrones the tv show that should have been life altering for me and my <laughs> level of fandom. Do you know what I mean? Like like that that should have rocked me to my core. But I don't get any gratif- gratification or I get minimal gratification out of that scene when you don't show me the northerners realizing that Sansa is their queen because of what she's done for them, you know, over the last season, because she was the only one who cared about food or the troops resting after the, the, the battle against the dead or, or, or why John needs to fucking stake his claim because the people of the North don't want to bend the knee just because he did like, show me any scene of anybody talking about, Sansa and her like build, building you know any sort of ladder to get there um, without scenes of like Sansa actually getting to build this this kingdom around her you know what uh, then no matter how incredible the costume is which was I mean, truly the most spectacular costume in the show's history, including Danny's white coat from a couple of, from from a couple seasons ago. But um, but I, I can't get the same gratification out of it that I feel like I've earned after so long with this show um, th- that I did because nobody nobody told the story of how she got there. It was just like, well, we know she's good. And so the people all decide that that she's good. (laughs) Something else, though, that was really satisfying um, that I just thought of, but is the and like I saw a lot of people talking about this online. But I don't know, just just to like add to the list of the short list of things that I I did really enjoy. uh, The fact that the that uh, Jamie and Brienne were using two halves of Ned Stark's sword to defend Winterfell. Mm. That was like beautiful and very very good and again you know this like the the larger thing a lot of really lovely beats and moments just uh undermined by being strung together by nothing yes (laughs) but like that story was lovely for a time (laughs) (laughs) like uh yeah (laughs) they could have had all they had to do was have brienne flip a page in the white book and start her own page in the white book of the no, King's Guard. Brienne is Sansa's sworn sword. She doesn't okay. fucking belong okay. there. No, no, no. This is no. what I was going to say before. She should not have been there at all. But I do understand that, like, that's that's a thing that's personal to me. But I don't think the show is destroyed by by making oh, that sure. mistake, yes, yes, or that her char- or that her character is destroyed by by leaving that out. Do I absolutely feel that she has no fucking place in King's Landing and should be Lord, uh, Lord Lady Commander of the Queen's Guard? Thank you very much. Yes, I agree. And also, Podrick should be there too. But like, if they're gonna make the choice to have her in King's Landing, then like, and and show that scene of her writing in this fucking book that somehow survived this fire. She- 
she should also <laughs> be flipping the page to write her own, like start her own entry, if that's what we're going to do with her. Like right. acknowledge that what's happening here is she's starting her own story and that like the point of her story isn't Jamie. Right. And that's what makes this so infuriating is that like, it only takes one logical step further or yes. I don't know any woman in the writer's room in the last three years to make that happen. That's all you need. But when you don't think through things and you don't hire women, you don't get a better story for the greatest character on this show than at the end she writes in her diary about her boyfriend. To be clear, I had a lot of like faith in this, probably past the point where I should have, because people were already like up in arms about Jamie leaving in the middle of the night and her in her house coat in the middle of winter outside yelling at him and crying. And I was still like, well, she can have emotions. Like she can cry. This is heartbreaking. Right. And I also still thought that Jamie was going to kill Cersei at <laughs> right. that point. <laughs> That's yep. why I was still like, no, nope. yep. and like, this is what he needs to do. Let him go kill his sister lover. Like, we'll be fine here. Um, so I was still giving the show the benefit of the doubt, to be clear. Like, I was not hating it right out of the gate. But the fact that it started there and then it went to Jamie running back into Cersei's arms and then, you know, Brienne finally ending up like, finishing his story like those were like the three hits that I was like oh this story doesn't actually care about Brienne the night like it's finishing on this note of like Brienne once she slept with Jamie and that was so disappointing to me and it was a frustrating like weird turn in Jamie's story I don't have a problem with Jamie dying with Cersei I just again like you needed something what like one little additional beat of like real explanation uh you know as to why why Jamie is making this choice like the 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 sort of throwaway of like I never really cared like is no like no I like I am so racked with guilt about like shit that I've done that I don't feel like I deserve a better life like that like that is a thing that you could do yes, and it's sure. almost there it's like they're so close to it but they don't they don't deliver us that uh like instead it was just n- lol the last three seasons were a joke i'm going back to king's landing now <gasps> like in this really just weird weird way uh, and yeah like where we go like where we ended up there are ways to get there like even that sort of circle of things that you know whether or not that's my sort of preferred ending eh, whatever like I I just I I just need like one or two more steps in each of these stories to explain how we get there oh you mean it's not narratively satisfying that (laughs) Jamie and Cersei are killed by one layer of small falling rocks because that is what they are buried underneath when Tyrion finds them. And also the rest of the room is fine. So if they had walked a few steps to the left, they would not have died. It, you mean that's not a satisfying ending? <laughs> Even more than like the brand thing, that is probably the one. So I said before that like I'm generally content with, you know, where everything ended up. It's just, you know, I, I'm I'm not happy about how we got there by and large. Uh, like the brand thing being a, a glaring exception and the the other sort of big thing for me is I like I just really wanted Jamie to kill Cersei. And like like yes. I, I, I've talked about it on this podcast many times. How many times have we said Jamie Cersei murder right. suicide? Like go back and count. Drink every Drink time, every we, time said. we say yes. it. And so like and this is and that's like that's a me thing. I, like I'm, I'm okay. Like I acknowledge that this is a personal attachment that I have. But also it's like another one of the prophecies that sort of amounts to nothing in the end. Which the show made a point of including. The show never needed to fucking include Maggie the Maggie the frog thing like that wasn't gonna matter then then leave it leave it out leave it out leave it out the other piece of the like Brienne story which again is like this whole thing of like you you didn't think this all the way through is that when you think about like what the show is saying happens to these characters for them to reach their end like Brienne got knighted hooray and then it was like and don't worry she's not a virgin anymore <laughs> what <laughs> like what <laughs> <laughs> Do you think any of us cared? Like, really, that's like the note she needed to hit before we like close this off. The, the, some of the things that the show just 
in these like six limited episodes that it dedicated time to. I'm like, that's what you think the people want? A, a fight between Jamie and Euron? Like literally nobody cares. Or- uh, I can't believe we spent any time in the finale of Game of Thrones watching Euron, or, or not in the finale, but in the pre-finale of Game of Thrones watching Euron and Jamie like kill each other. No, I've never cared about a fight less. <laughs> like tr- <laughs> truly, truly never. And and there were so many things like that. I mean, you already gave us Arya walking through King's Landing, seeing the destruction that Danny did to everyone, which was powerful because it reminded you of Arya in Bravos walking through injured and just like other journeys Arya has taken through like complete disasters. But then you do like an even longer scene of Tyrion walking through in the next episode <laughs> afterwards when everything's rubble. And I'm just like, okay, but like, this, I felt like screaming at the TV, like, you guys know this is the end of the show, right? <laughs> you guys know you don't have any more time, and this and and this is what we're spending time on. It felt like we, the audience, was saying, this is not enough time. And the writers were going, we have too much time. Yeah. How can we uh, pad this out? <laughs> <laughs> I will say that the one of the few arcs that I have very little to complain about, except maybe a general shrug at, at the ending, is Arya in this season. Like, I'm pretty content. Mm. Like, Arya got to bang Gendry. Uh, Arya got to kill the Night King. Like, I I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm I'm happy nope. for Arya. Oh no, no, <laughs> no. See, uh, I'm I was happy. I was not one of the people complaining about Arya killing the Night King. I thought that was a way that was like not super predictable, but that still really worked. Which like, still of sat- she satisfying, she's and there was payoff. Satisfying, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. She's an assassin. She sneaked up on him. Oh, the whole episode is showing us her sneaking around and making her way around the army of the dead. So the fact that she got around them and killed the the Night King, beautiful. Chef's kiss. Loved it. <laughs> My whole thing was like Arya's story to me. And again, this is like personal interpretation, but I feel like we spent so much time watching her lose herself and trying to become no one to then finally realize I am Arya Stark of Winterfell. And the amount of time that she spent leaving Winterfell behind and her siblings, I was like, I don't, why do we, but why? Like, why did we spend all that time for her to find her identity and then just kind of like, okay, but you know, I, I gotta be not here. Or, you know, why did we spend all that time watching her gain these abilities? And she does kill the Night King, but we never really see any of that else in action. So there are parts of her story that I was just like, I don't know. And, uh, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, she could have put Gendry on a boat. He has experience with boats. He sh- She should have taken him <laughs> along for the ride. But that's a lesser complaint. The other stuff is real. I mean, there's nothing more real than... Gendry should have been on the boat too. <laughs> that, that, that I think is 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 the realist. It was fine. It wasn't my favorite. I don't know why she sailed off like Christopher Columbus at the end there, but I, I don't know that that's not where I expected it to be. Also, Camp Brand just tell her what what's west of Westeros. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's just I, it's just a thought. It's just a thought. A little a little bit like you know distressing just. For more in my heart reasons, like, I don't know that I can necessarily actually call this a, like, narrative flaw, but, like, in my heart reasons, the fact that, like, all the Stark kids came back together one last time, only to, like, be, like, clearly set themselves up to never see each other again. Like, right. they are never gonna fucking see each other again. Uh, and that's upsetting. I mean, maybe Sansa and Bran will, like, have reason to, uh, you know, diplomacy. Right, there's gotta like, be more like, weird council meetings with Ed and your Tully, right. because we all were just dying to see Ed and you're totally once more in the fucking finale. I mean, I was, but normal people weren't. Okay, if Sansa didn't get Brienne, then, like, she should have at least had Arya. Like, where, where is Sansa's Who uh, is defending my girl? Lady Warrior? Where's her honor guard? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> we have priorities, and they are who is guarding the queen. <laughs> we know no queen, but the queen in the north. His, His name, name is Stark. Stark. Preach. Um, I, I, I will say... John was kind of like a non-entity to me for most of the season, really. It felt like he got sidelined, and then he stabbed Danny, uh, and then he sidelined himself again. Um, which, like, is fine by me, because in addition to all the other uh, canonical relationships I got, I also got John and Tormund together in the end, uh, <laughs> married beyond the wall. And if you that's not how you read that scene, then I can't help you, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I know in my heart... 
<laughs> that John Mund is canon. I don't know. It just feels like they're like we talked about a lot, but I, I feel like there's so much else. I know. Also, but it's also all the same. And yes, it's all right. this was not well written. And like any piece of it that we can pick out and like examine, it's like, oh yes, I see this was not well right. written. It, it, it all like, has the, the same that's root it. problem. So Yes. Yes. <laughs> round and round in circles. I mean, honestly, I feel like this episode was really just another, you know, as this podcast often is, round of like media therapy. Like uh, yes. we get had a lot of feelings, uh, got to talk now as a group, <laughs> got to get all of that out. And uh and now now we're done with Game of Thrones. There's no more Game of Thrones um until George R. R. Martin writes another book and then we all gotta come back together to read and discuss that. But until that time <laughs> at least the memes are forever. And the real <laughs> Game of Thrones was the memes we made along the way. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> that brings us to the end of this episode of the podcast. Thank you, Sam, for joining us on this journey. And thank you to all of you for listening. If you are enjoying this podcast and would like to make us one of those $5,000 a month. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Patreon campaigns. <laughs> uh, we would love it if you consider joining our community on Patreon at patreon.com slash snark squad. We would love to hear all of your thoughts on Game of Thrones. There are, as we mentioned, recaps for each episode from this season up on StarkSquad.com, but there will also be a post for this episode of the podcast uh, at StarkSquad.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Snark underscore Squad. I am at Sweeney Says. You can find me at My Name is Marines. And I'm at Democracy Diva. Thank you, as always, to Stefan Chin for the theme music that is playing us out right now, and we will be back in your feed next week. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.